actually our first community meeting uh, that is post the era of Paul Costello. For those of you who don't know, Paul was our longtime executive director, 21 year tenure at the helm of VCRD. And we just, last week was his last week. Uh, he's, he's moved on. And so we're, we are adjusting. We, he's not with us tonight, but we are really excited to have a new executive director uh, Brian Lowe as part of our team at the Council on Rural Development. So uh, welcome, folks. We will um, give it a minute or two. We always find people uh, sort of trickle in as we get started. So I think we're really going to get going in a couple of minutes here. So if you'll just bear with us, we're going to um, let people gather. If anyone wants to use the chat to introduce yourself. Sometimes that can be a nice thing to do. If you're, um, if you are in Rochester or one of the surrounding towns, maybe let let folks know what where what part of the region you live in. That can be a helpful thing for us to just get people placed. So if anyone wants to introduce themselves in chat, that that would be great as we get going here. And by the way, I'm John Copans. I'm the program director for the Climate Economy Model Communities Program here at the Vermont Council on Rural Development. It's, it's wonderful to see all of these faces gathering on the screen. You know, we, um, as an organization, we've had to adapt to these, these different times. Normally, we would be gathering somewhere in, in, a, in a group space. We might, we might have shared a meal together. And, um, and we, we, to be honest, we miss that at VCRD. We really love getting together in person. But we also feel like it's really important still to gather even in an online way and to keep doing our work. So huge appreciation to you all for being willing to get on a screen tonight and, uh, and spend your evening thinking about uh, Rochester and the surrounding towns and how, how we rally together as communities. All right, I feel like I should go ahead and get started because we have a very busy evening. And Nick, you know what, if you want to go ahead, I think we're going to share screen with some slides. The first slide is just an agenda slide uh, that'll be helpful for folks to see. But I, here's how we're gonna structure things tonight, just so folks have a feeling for what's ahead. Uh, we are gonna just spend 15 minutes as a whole group gathered. And then pretty quickly here, we're gonna get out into breakout groups and we're gonna really have sort of the meat of our conversation tonight will be uh, a set of two different uh, breakout slots, four, four total breakout groups, because we're doing two times two, as you can see there on the agenda. But I want to give a little bit of context in some opening remarks before we go uh, into those breakouts. And so uh, let me just grab my notes. So, uh, so this meeting is convened by an organization called the Vermont Council on Rural Development. Uh, I'm a program director at the Council on Rural Development. We've got, uh, I've got some coworkers who are, who are helping with tonight's event. I wanna just quickly give you a sense of who we are as an organization before we get started. Our, our mission as an organization is really uh, to work with communities around Vermont, with Vermont small towns around the state uh, to help them achieve their visions for vitality and prosperity uh, of those communities. And we do that primarily as an organization that's a facilitator and a convener. We have hosted town-based conversations in probably over a hundred different communities in all corners of the state of Vermont. As Paul Costello used to say, we've probably convened more conversations than any other organization in the state at the town based level. Nice to see some nods there from Senator Clarkson. That's good, uh, good verification. So, and, and what we don't do when we come into a community is we don't come in with preset solutions for what's best for you. Instead, what we do is we provide a vehicle and a conversation for, for you all to come together as a community or a set of communities to think about your future, to identify some priorities that you want to work on, 
and then to think about, okay, now that we've identified those priorities, how are we going to get them done? That's really the core of our work as an organization. We're neutral, we're nonpartisan, we're very intentionally nonpartisan because we think that's fundamental to our work in building trust in communities and in being this facilitative organization. Tonight's conversation is part of a program that we call the Climate Economy Model Communities Program. And man, that's a mouthful, isn't it? But I wanna just tee up for you a little bit about what when we use the expression climate economy at the Council on Rural Development, I just wanna give you a little bit of context around that. You know, I've come to think of the climate economy in a few different ways. The way that we started thinking about the climate economy was that when we think about this global challenge called climate change, there are all of these nations and all of these businesses and organizations that are trying to figure out the best ways to tackle climate change, essentially to wean our economy from fossil fuels and to figure out new ways of doing things and new ways of living that don't contribute to climate change. And essentially that's like a competition, a global competition and Vermont can compete in that global marketplace. And if we can figure out the models for tackling climate change here in Vermont, it's gonna create huge job opportunities and economic opportunity here in Vermont. There are, whether, let's say you figure out a new way for Vermonters to use less energy while still uh, heating their homes. That is something that you could market out to the rest of the world. So there's, there's tremendous job opportunities in being the place that solves those problems. But here's another way that I think about the climate economy. I really think about it at the household scale as well. You know, Efficiency Vermont, who's part of our conversation tonight, every year they, or so they do a, a report called the Energy Burden Report. And what it shows is that Vermonters spend nearly $5,000 typically on their energy costs as a household. And half of that is just filling up the gas in their, in their cars and trucks. And so if you think about a typical household budget, that's, that's a big piece of the pie. And there's opportunities for households to achieve savings there. And honestly, when we help our households save money, what we do is we invest those dollars back into the economy because what people do then is they have more money to spend on other things in their community. The final way that I think about the climate economy or that we might think about the climate economy is really, um, I would say, most informed by the last year and a half as we've grappled with the pandemic. What we are reminded of over the last 18 months is that Vermont's really not an island. We, uh, we suffer or benefit from all of these trends that happen globally, and the pandemic is a real example of that. Uh, and as we think to a future, you know, let's, let's take an example. Vermont has become a more attractive place for people while with remote work becoming a real possibility for more people around the country. And frankly, rural places like Vermont, because we're a little more spaced out and we're, 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 we were seen as a safe place to live, what we know is that our communities, all of a sudden, the houses in our communities are getting more expensive because people are moving to our rural communities in a way that they never used to. And what we're actually already hearing about is other people moving to Vermont because of climate, uh, because of climate trends around the United States. The wildfires in the West have people mm -hmm. picking up and moving, and Vermont is increasingly an appealing place to be. So I just share that as an example of the kind of trends that we see, both nationally and globally, that Vermont is uh, is going to be impacted by. And so. With the reason I'm sharing all of that as context is when we talk about the climate economy model communities program, the question that I would frame to you all, to Rochester, to Hancock, to Granville, uh, to Stockbridge, to Pittsfield, like the Quintown region that we think of when we think of this conversation, what I would say is, how do you think about the future of these communities? What does, a vi what does a vital region look like, a prosperous region look like, and how do you plan for some of those changes that we think are coming? And how do we do that in a way that's not divisive, but mm -hmm. unifying? That's the real mission of our work in this model communities program. 
you know, with that, I want, and, and I want to make a quick note about the Model Communities Program. We only go where we're invited to go. And it was the Rochester Select Board, actually, that said we would like to participate in this Model Communities Program. And with that, I actually want to quickly call on your Rochester Select Board Chair, somebody I've gotten to know a little bit. We share a passion for spikes, actually. Uh, Dune Hendricks is just going to say a word of welcome. So, Dune, if you want to go ahead and unmute uh, it would be great oh, to just hear a welcome. I don't think I am muted, am I? You're good. Yep. I'm good. All right. Well, welcome. I guess I'm the latecomer. I um, I was running, uh, but I'm here. I am now, and and thank you all for for being here. I'm hoping we have representatives from um, the larger community r ranging up and down the valley because really this is much more than just the the town of Rochester. This is. Um, it's going to take teamwork to move into the future and and um, and, and working together, um, sharing our energy and our ideas. And um, I would hope that um, one of the um, one of the goals, the tasks that everyone here could go away, what, away with is how to um, how to inspire and enlist um, more people to join so it doesn't just fall down to the same collection of of people that are always um, carrying the load because um, this all, it all matters to, to all of us and it affects all of us. And it's, um, we're um, very thankful for John's, um, you know, offer to, to come and help um, guide uh, exploration of, of what we can do to be uh, um, proactive moving into the future. Uh, thank you, Doom. We're we are, I, and I have to say, uh, uh, we, for us as staff at the Council on Rural Development, the opportunity to get to work in communities like Rochester and the surrounding towns is really a privilege. We feel so lucky to get to meet great folks. And your point about sharing the load is uh, is really uh, right on point. Because actually, the, the next thing I want to do is thank a few folks who carry some load in terms of doing some work in the community. You know, I've had. Uh, we engaged a steering committee at the beginning of this process to, they came up with the name Rochester Area Climate Initiative, and they came up with some plans in terms of launching this process. But I wanna give a shout out specifically to three folks who've been real allies as I've gotten my feet under me in, in making connections in the community. And that's Catherine Shankman and Vic Roboto, and finally, Jeff Gephardt, who's the energy coordinator in Rochester. And just a little mention of Jeff, boy, he works so hard in terms of doing, thinking about the energy opportunities for Rochester. And he's, um, he's really been a great partner in this work. So just a big thank you to that team. And thank you, Dune, and to the select board for the invitation to come to Rochester. All right, I've got to quickly do a couple more things here. We are really honored and maybe just stop sharing for a second, Nick, and then I'm gonna ask you to share again, because it would be nice for us to be able to see more people. I, uh, as part of this opening process, we have a visiting team of folks, and I want to recognize them as we get started. I'm just gonna run through these names quickly, because we gotta stay on schedule here, or uh, Alex Tolstoy from the Preservation Trust of Vermont is with us, uh, Becca White from Efficiency Vermont, Dan Courier, from the Vermont Agency of Transportation, Erica Hoffman Kais from Green Mountain Economic Development Corp, Josh Hanford, a neighbor from a neighboring town who's the commissioner of the Vermont Department of Housing and Community Development, Peter Gre Gregory, the director of Two Rivers Ottaquichi Regional Commission, and Sarah Peary from Green Mountain Power uh, are here with us tonight. Uh, you'll get a sense of the role of that visiting team as we move forward, but huge appreciation for them for quote unquote, coming to the Rochester region tonight to listen to all you have and to provide some perspective. So thank you all as visiting team members. All right, uh, Nick, if you could bring, oh, and let me just quickly mention and introduce our VCRD staff too. Uh, we've got Margaret McCoy, we've got Alyssa Johnson, we've got Nick Kramer, and we've got Jenna Koloski, and we will be facilitating and serving as scribes for tonight's uh, event. All right, Nick, if you could go to the next slide, you know, I want to just give you a little bit of quick context about how this process is going to roll forward. Uh, we are tonight, uh, it's the kickoff of this process. 
the real goal of these breakout sessions is to get your ideas for the future of the Rochester region. We've got some topics for those conversations, but let me tell you, those topics are not meant to be hard guardrails to the conversation. Any ideas that you've got for the future of the region are welcome. We will facilitate those conversations tonight, and we've got scribes taking careful notes about that. And then uh, coming up November 1st, we are going to come reconvene a group of folks, at all of you and more, my hope is, to, uh, to make some decisions about the priorities you want to work on as a region. And what I will do between tonight and then is I will take all of your ideas, I'll sort of map them out and identify some core areas of work and I'll bring them back to you. We'll probably have somewhere between 10 and 20 different possible ideas of areas of action and you'll make some decisions with dot voting. We're hoping that'll be in person at Pierce Hall on the evening of November 1st. That's a Monday evening, so mark your calendars. And then a final formal step in the process is after you identify those three priorities, our hope is that many of you will sign up to do some work. And just like Dune was saying, some new folks hopefully get involved as we go through this so that we can share that load. And then we will, in, we will bring those, bring task forces together to really do some strategic planning around those priorities and then move towards implementation. So that's sort of the general game plan for this process. For tonight's conversation, oh, actually, Nick, bring up the next slide before I get to tonight's conversation, if that's all right. There, you know, not everybody wants to be on Zoom. Not everyone wants to participate in the meeting. I just want to mention that we've got a couple other ways to get the ideas into this process. We've got an online survey, and we've got that link um, there. We're also having, having an in-person forum at Rochester Elementary School on October 12th. That'll be pretty similar to these online meetings. Any of you are welcome, but I would really encourage you to spread the word. That's happening next Tuesday evening. And then just to mention that we do maintain a website for this uh, Rochester, climate, uh, Rochester Region Climate Initiative uh, that I would encourage you to check out. We'll keep that updated as we go. All right. So now uh, with that, I think it's time to get into the breakout groups because that's really where our action is gonna happen tonight. Um, and let me just tee up what we're gonna do in those breakout conversations. Uh, the first two, Nick, you can go ahead and bring up the next slide actually, oops. Um, the first, Nick, if you wanna bring up, I think the next slide has some directions for us for the breakouts. Yeah, there we go. So here are the first two breakout conversations. Uh, number one is around economic development, job creation and transportation. Number two is around energy opportunities for towns, homes and businesses. And what we would like you to do, this might feel a little complicated, but it's really not so hard, is if you can rename yourself with the number of the breakout group that you wanna be in, and I'll show you, maybe I'll do it for myself right now. I'm going to go to number two. So you see how my name just, I just added a two in front of it. If you can do that to pick your breakout group, that's gonna get us started um, here and we will put you into those breakout groups to get things going. So remember one is economic development. Number two is energy opportunities for towns, homes and businesses. And then the facilitators will guide the conversation from there once you are in your rooms. So uh, with that, welcome. Hello, hello. You know what, um, let's really quickly, because I think we have a small enough group, let's do a very quick round of introductions before we get into this conversation. And what I'm just gonna do as the facilitator for this is I'm just gonna call on people just maybe give us your, just give us, a, let's just give names rather than add anything to it because we got to move quickly here. So I, I, I'm looking to my left. Alex, you want to just introduce yourself? Yeah, Alex Solstoy, Preservation Trust. Awesome. Uh, Becca. Uh, Becca White, and I'm from Efficiency Vermont. Uh, James. I'm from Grandville, Vermont. Excellent. Chris. Chris Williams from Hancock. Super. Alyssa. Hi, everyone. Alyssa Johnson, VCRD. Maureen. 
Oh, Maureen. Maureen yeah. Gannon, uh, Rochester, Vermont. Wonderful. Peter. Peter Gregory, Two Rivers Out of Quichy Regional Commission. Uh, Jeffrey Gephardt. Jeffrey Gephardt. <laughs> Sue. Rochester, Vermont. Hey, Sue. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sue Roboto, Rochester. Excellent. Sarah. Sarah Peary, Green Mountain Power. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Gerard, if that's Gerard. I'm just reading off a of names here. So. Mary Beth Deller and Jerry LeBlond from Rochester. Hi, Hi. Mary. Diane. Diane Tietzel from Rochester. Christine. Christine Mayer, Rochester, Vermont. And Doom. It's me from Rochester, Vermont, also. <laughs> and Michaela. Oh, maybe Michaela's a little. Well, welcome, everybody. Let's get started here. So I, um, oh, oh. Michaela's mic isn't working. Oh, there's Carolyn. Hey, Carolyn, you want to say hi? Hi, I'm Carolyn from Rochester. All right. Well, it's nice to meet you all. Uh, here is how we're going to structure this conversation. Alyssa is our scribe. So just so you know, she is going to be busy taking notes tonight. And um, we are going to, here's how we'll structure things. We have a little less than an hour. We're going to talk about the assets and challenges in relation to energy use in homes and businesses and the municipalities, the towns, uh, we're gonna, and then we're really gonna spend the bulk of our time with your ideas and opportunities in terms of addressing this topic. And then finally, in the last like seven, five or seven minutes, we will hear from the visiting team. I'm, my job in part is to watch the clock to make sure that we uh, wrap this up right around 7.15, maybe 7.20. Uh, if we um, have a little more to cover. And, um, you know, just in terms of process, I think we're a small enough group that if you want to contribute something, the easiest way is just to unmute yourself. And when I see you unmute, I'll probably cl clue into it and I'll call on you and you can just talk. Uh, if you want, there's also a raise hand function, which you're welcome to use as well, but I'm not sure uh, we'll need to do that. So here's my first question for you all. When we think about energy use in, uh, in your towns, in, in these towns, uh, what are some of the assets you have uh, in terms of energy use? What are some of the things that you can work from as assets? Diane? Yes, I think because we have the substation in town, I think that that's a huge asset for using um, if we're targeting transportation to put in chargers for electric vehicles, be it town um, owned or for visitors since we're a scenic byway. Uh -huh. Great. So you've got some good grid infrastructure with that substation. Is that what you're getting at? Yes. Awesome. Great. Other assets. Maureen. Yeah, we have a defined town center, so to uh, put in uh, resources that we can for the whole community to use, we have a place where, and, and room where things can go. Clarify that a little. Do you mean you have a village center in Rochester? Is that what you mean? Or Yes, uh, we have a village okay. center, we have a green, we have a place where people can gather, and if you had those kinds of charging resources, for instance, that would be a place where people could come together. And we have restaurants and, you know, places in town. So if you want to need it to charge your car for an hour, there's some place to go and sit, which is another problem with an electric car. Excellent. Got it. That's great. Uh, James, you're unmuted. Maybe do you want to add something? Well, I guess um, probably our biggest asset as far as contributing to the community is that we do have a, uh, or my understanding we still have it, a three-phase uh, line coming out of that substation running up to the bowl mill in Granville. Uh -huh. So, you know, if you are to have 
you know, a large solar farm or whatever you would like to call it, you need to be fairly close to that to that line in order to be able to get it on the grid. Excellent. I'm impressed. Not many people know about the grid infrastructure in their communities. And already we've had two people mention that. So uh, bravo. It's more important than I think most of us appreciate. So what are some other assets? Um, I'll speak to one. Uh, I think one um, pretty substantial asset is that we are served by Green Mountain Power and their willingness and um, efforts towards um, moving into the future. I mean, they've um, uh, where they're pretty good to work with. They offer lots of incentives, and and I think we're we're um, lucky to have them as a as our supplier. Awesome. Thanks, Dune. Yeah, we often hear about those utilities around the country that don't quite have the same progressive mentality. So we're we're lucky on that front. Other assets, other Sue. Uh, tagging on to what Maureen said about a, a, a town center, I live in town and um, uh, I can walk to all kinds of services in Rochester. Uh, we, we only have one car between the two of us, which is nice. Yeah, I have to say, having now been to town a few times in this work, that the, and like a grocery store is a perfect example. Like the fact that you can live in that village center and uh, and get to a lot of stuff by foot, it's pretty fabulous. Others, uh, and wave at me, like I see Michaela, like I know you're both on phone and on mic. If, if folks, uh, if I'm not recognizing folks, just wave or, or just chime in too. We're a small enough group that I don't think we're gonna interrupt each other. Yeah, Diane. Well, I would like to also mention that we are a farming community. So if anybody's ever interested in following the 100 mile diet, we can easily uh, look at our local farms and our farmers markets to supply a lot of the local food to decrease the carbon emissions with transporting that tomato from California when we can easily get it at the farmers market in town. Excellent. And I'm guessing that I hadn't heard of the 100 mile diet, but I'm guessing them it, that that is to eat things only from within 100 miles. Am I right about that? You are. Try to source your food from within 100 miles. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So that kind of prohibits fish, doesn't it? Say that, James. Sorry, I missed it. I say that kind of prohibits having fish in your diet. <laughs> well, oh. there's some freshwater fish, heck, some trout or some bass, maybe. <laughs> Only if you have a pond. <laughs> uh, um, speaking of um, water, um, it's, it's not um, easily accessed from the regulatory front, but we do have um, this river running through our valleys. And in the past, um, that has served to um, provide power to, um, you know, in smaller areas. I know that's not a currently a, a popular or easy thing, but if we're just throwing out um, resources, that is that is one. Absolutely, yep. James, go for it. And then Chris uh, Unfortunately, it. we've been kind of regulated out of that as a resource. Yes, let's not dive too deeply into that topic. We could spend a night on it, but um, yes. Uh, Chris, you have well, something? Uh, in the, in all of the valleys here, we have uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a wind resource that we're not using, and I've always looked at the uh, the turbine size uh, over there in Virgins that they use, and thought that a turbine of that size or maybe two of them uh, might find a place somewhere um, in our valley, and uh, hopefully then. Uh, charge uh, some battery storage that Green Mountain Power has been talking about for our communities. So anyway, you know, uh, over the decades, there's been a lot of demonization of the, the wind resource. And I think we need to give it a look. Um, Great. Thanks, Chris. James, I didn't mean to interrupt if you had another sort of part to your point before I... Well, I was that. just wondering if, you know, part of part of the task is ultimately gonna come down to some kind of uh, 
legislative action in order to implement some of these ideas or whatever? Or are we basically planning as if there are going to be no legislative changes? It makes a big difference. Yeah, it's a good it's a good question and one we constantly grapple with at the Council on Rural Development is there's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing. You kind of have to plan as though you're dealing with the current landscape, but let's be honest, around climate change the landscape is changing pretty radically. I mean, as folks know, there's a there's a climate council that's coming up with a big list of recommendations for the legislature and so on one hand we have to be cognizant of what the current landscape is, but I also feel like let's not be too much hindered by that as well. And I guess my encouragement to you all is you don't worry about the details. This is a brainstorming session. There is no bad idea in this conversation. So just throw things out there in terms of assets and challenges or ideas. We, we, what we don't probably want to do is get mired too much in the details, I, I would say. So other assets. Well, one asset that um, we're um, all sharing at different levels is the technological evolution and breakthroughs that are, are leading to more efficiency. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, Carolyn. Well, I'm thinking about <clears throat> our beautiful natural environment. And we do have a wonderful forest collection around in this area and the importance of keeping it in balance with its needs so that it is cleaning the air for us. And we need, I can't give you the statistics about how much air one tree will do, but it's pretty, pretty impressive. So I think just thinking of that, you know, not just building new things, but preserving what we have too. Yeah, and appreciating and sort of putting a value on some of those things that you've already got. Yep, that's great. Thanks, Carolyn. Christine. I would say we also have a lot of models and examples from our people. So we already have folks that are putting solar on their roofs and have already been living off grid for many years and can share that knowledge and wisdom. I think that's a huge, awesome, positive resource to have. If you hadn't said that when I was thinking of it myself, that's a great one. Yeah. Is that Mary there? Yes. Um, we are a forest service community and the forest service is very much interested in healthy forests and uh, contributing to a healthy climate through healthy forests. Healthy forests. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Well, let me ask a question maybe on the uh, asset front, which is, my guess is that Rochester is similar to a lot of places around Vermont, which is some people heat with cordwood or pellets. Am I, first of all, am I right about that? Like maybe a nodding of like, and do you, is there, maybe this is, a, uh, this is in, in the balance category, but do you have good local sources for cordwood to, for those who do heat with cordwood, I guess, That's a curiosity? Yes. Aha, uh -huh. see some nod, nodding of heads there. Great. All right, let's shift over to the challenges. So as we think about energy and how we heat our homes, where we get our electricity for homes and businesses, for the town as a whole, what are some of the challenges uh, in, in terms of maybe using electricity or making transitions with energy? What, what are some of the challenges uh, that you all face? And maybe I'll just seed it with one that James mentioned. Sometimes there's regulatory challenges. Uh, you know, we were talking about small hydro as an example where that's something that has a pretty difficult regulatory pathway. So that's an example of a challenge. Jeff, go for it. So we have a lot of uh, old buildings um, it, that, that, that belong to the municipality here in Rochester. And, and I know there's some old buildings in the rest of the Quintown region. Um, that are difficult and expensive to bring up to speed for climate change. Great. Yeah. Old buildings. Yeah, it looks like I've frozen everybody. Oh, you came back. 
and and that's both municipal buildings might you also apply that to the housing stock as well jeff absolutely okay yep absolutely. and probably businesses too if we look around it's there's yeah okay great what are some other challenges that folks can think of uh diane and then mary after that yes if we're looking towards transportation for instance and to try to get off the fossil fuels that we definitely need, I feel, as a town to look at not only people that are homeowners, but renters as well, and that includes businesses, that, for instance, we're lucky enough at home to have solar electric and solar hot water. But if I was a renter, I wouldn't be able to put that up on my roof. So if I wanted to recharge my electric car or my electric truck, if I was um, needing it for work, my, my vision for that is to make either the substation or the gas station, make it into a station and have that as a resource for the community where eventually gas stations in the long run are not gonna make it financially on selling a cup of coffee. They need a revenue stream once gasoline starts petering out. So what can we replace that business and help that business or those businesses thrive and still be there in the future? So my vision for Rochester is to have um, a gas station also have a station for power because if you're a renter, for instance, you can always go into town and Sue had mentioned it um, that we're lucky that a lot of a lot of people can walk into town, but some can't. So let them take their EV, go into town, go to the post office, charge it up, um, either at the gas station or at the substation. Um, have lunch, go food shopping. By that time, you're home and you're fully charged. But renters won't be able to do that. And even if you can't afford to have solar on your house or our houses that are older may not be able to support the, the weight of a solar array to go into town again and to charge locally. To give options, I think that's a challenge. We need to, there's not enough options for people that can't afford to put solar on their house or renters that need an option that if they do wanna go electric and that's the trend for transportation now, we need to give them options to do that in our local community. Got it. All right. Thanks, Diane. And, and let me just acknowledge that I think you did two things there. You did both a challenge and you suggested some solutions, which is great, I think. And I saw Alyssa typing away. There was, a, there was probably a few ideas embedded in that. So that was, that was excellent. Thank you. Uh, Maureen. Yeah, a, a challenge also we've been having, I mean, we're still waiting to get, an, to find an electrician who can put our level two chargers into our garage. So we, we need access to more people that are trained mm -hmm. to do these things and to get them done in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. I swear we could be sitting in the House Energy and Technology Committee right now. You all are like naming the wisdom of a group like this. Is You're naming some of the fundamental challenge we face as a state. So I just have to say that. Thank you. That's, that's uh, great. Others, uh, who else is trying to get a word in here? Oh, yeah, Mary, thanks. Mary Beth. Yeah, Mary Hi. Beth, sorry. I'm following up. Uh, I'm following up on something Sue Roboto listed as an asset, which is that we can walk anywhere in town. But one of the challenges is that we have either no sidewalk walks or very bad sidewalks. And they're especially treacherous in winter. And it is energy um, expensive and difficult to maintain them safely. And I want to offer a solution at the same time, which is to have a solar powered heated sidewalk. <laughs> All right. That would allow more walking around town and less driving. Thanks, Mary Beth. All right, who else? Other other challenges before we get into the idea phase, although I can tell we're going to the idea phase pretty quick here. Doom. And, um, basic, the one basic challenge um, for where we live is is the climate. I mean, it's, it's gorgeous in the summer, but then in the winter, it demands um, a lot out of heating our homes and transportation 
um, in terms of maintaining roads and maintaining vehicles. So that's the climate is which and the environment which drew a lot of us here is is one of the big challenges too. Great. Uh, Christine. On transportation, I would add that um, while the community, the, the Rochester Village is walkable, you don't have to go very far before it's no longer so. Um, after Route 73 and then going area. Um, likewise, uh, if there were bike paths or walking paths, uh, you know, we could we could uh, link the community together in a way other than the highway. I think I got that. Jeff, unfortunately, your connection's a little tenuous. You're starting to slow down, but I think, yeah, the dispersed uh, nature of settlement outside of the village center and maybe some other ways for folks to get uh, around in addition to cars. Is that, that's the gist of it. Uh, Christine. Yes. I'm, I'm taking notes as well. And big one I haven't heard is cost. Just just the cost of, of making all of these changes um, to a community who's, who's yeah. <laughs> The cost. <laughs> I'm glad you name it because sometimes it's like the most obvious things somehow get we fail to mention them and a, absolutely. Yep. Thanks, Christine. Other challenges before we shift over. You know, I see somebody on the phone like feel free if I just my fear as a facilitator is that somebody has something to say and doesn't feel like they have the opportunity to say it so be assertive in whatever way you need to if you have something to say and I'm for some reason missing the cue. All right, well, let's shift over to ideas and opportunities for the future. And we've heard a couple already. We've said we're uh, around uh, like EV charging and, and maybe a, a expanding the vision of a gas station that it's also a place where EV charging happens. Uh, and um, so what are some other ideas? Yeah, Diane. Well, I'm thinking that uh, when we first started with the solar electric and solar hot water, we were the outliers really um, with that. We, we really didn't speak to um, friends and family about it, basically, unless we were asked. So. I think for an idea is to have the town of Rochester lead by example. So if we are looking at, at speaking from the town perspective, but we're asking the, the town's asking the citizens to um, think more electric and less fossil fuels, then I think maybe the town, and I'm, I'm, I'm part of town, but I'm thinking specifically town owned properties leading by example. Let's get solar on the roof, um, make sure that all their uh, electric appliances are on power strips. Uh, how can we reduce the water at, in our buildings? Do we have low flow toilets? Do all the buildings have heat pumps? Um, can we get solar up there and how fast can we do it? Weatherization. I think that if the town itself leads by example, people will flock into the town office and say, you know, um, I'm interested in seeing that solar array on the town garage, or I'm interested in seeing how that heat pump works um, next time I come to the town meeting. Um, I think things like that, once they see it, I mean, you can hear it, but until you see it in action, it's a total, total different ball game. And then you start asking questions and thinking, you know, maybe I can do this at my home as well. But I think leading by example is the best thing also uh, to get these ideas out into the community. Got it. And just to say it back, basically comprehensive look at all the municipal buildings mm -hmm. and trying to transition all of them in a, in, in a lead by example sort of a way. Is that, yes. that, that's the gist of it, super, mm -hmm. that's great. All right, James. Yeah, I would just caution you to uh, make sure that, for example, the site is feasible in terms of what it's going to produce for you. You know, places located in these narrow valleys, 
do not get that much sun where it's, you know what I'm saying? We have to, I think there has to be a search in terms of where the solar sites are, are going to be successful. You don't want to demonstrate how not to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And so do it right. Let's just add to that. Let's do it. Whatever we're talking about here, let's do it well, such that it functions as we intend it to and is feasible. Right. So, all right. What are some other, I think I saw some other, uh, Maureen and then Jeff. Okay. Maureen and then Jeff, go for it. And piggybacking on what Diane said, at my house, I have Tesla battery have solar panels. I have two, one fully electric car and one plug-in hybrid car. So if there was a way to get those resources, who has what for people that are interested that they would know one of their neighbors actually has it and how it's working for that particular neighbor. And also we have Dune and the shop. And I think one of our problems is on some of these roads are fairly, cars come pretty fast and they're fairly dangerous. But um, if we could do something about that infrastructure at some way, day, some point, but also electric uh, electric bikes, maybe a way to rent or have electric bikes around, because it would certainly be fun to go from my house to town on electric bike. When I take my, out my own bike, I think twice about it just because of the hills. Great. A couple of great ideas there. And let's add to the asset list the fact that you have a bike shop up in Rochester. <laughs> That's part of your assets that we, um, we should remember. <laughs> Uh, all right, I saw some other. Hey, Carolyn, I'm going to call on you because you've had this idea about the park house that we've talked about, and I just sort of want you to mention it here because I feel like it. Let's get it into the mix, Carolyn. If can I do that to you? <laughs> oh, you're muted. So, all right. I the other thing that came to my mind while conversation was going on that. <clears throat> We do have a very large older population and it's increasing and they don't have the funds or the resources to be able to do a lot of purchasing of these wonderful things that could happen. But there's one thing that everybody can do in a tiny way. And I always think that it takes many grains of sand to make the mighty beach. <laughs> and so everybody has an important role they can play. And one of the thoughts was how can we save energy, save water, save electricity, very simply right within our own home and our daily activities. You know, how long do you keep the refrigerator door open when you're just trying to get a glass, like a quart of milk, you know, something. So, and the other is, you know, I remember my great grandson when he was just in kindergarten <clears throat> and I was brushing my teeth and he said, Lenny, turn off the faucet. <laughs> You know, not to leave it running while you're brushing your teeth. You know, as so many little things you could do. And I thought if the park house could take on this as a goal to reduce their heat and electricity bill, so we could handle some of the other costs that keep coming up with an old building, that um, it would, and get it to be sort of like a contest, you know, know what it is and then go for a certain time and see what you say but share it with the neighborhood, you know, and uh, get the kids to do it at home and school, you know, and then to see, you know, even if it's in the newspaper and published that so-and-so saved so many dollars or something, you know, or we even have some prizes, but to know that there's something that everybody can do, no matter how small, that contribute to the great world that we want to be able to continue in. And um, the other thing when we're thinking of things, I'll just add this, is that we have to think of the future in many ways. For one, food and getting enough food to feed population can become a serious problem. And we must not lose good agricultural land now for something to do quickly now and then need it later and we don't have it. So agriculture, you know, our forests, our quality of soil, all of these things are very important to maintain and keep strong 
when we add on new things. But anyway, that's kind of a crazy ending to my little grain of sand with saving water electricity. You know, put the light out when you leave the room. Don't leave it going. It doesn't cost any more to turn it on again. Thanks, Carolyn. I, th I think I heard a few ideas in there, but really appreciate it. I think I skipped over Jeff, too. Jeff Gephardt, I think you had something else to contribute. Well, given uh, the discussion that um, about solar, uh, Jim's comment, Maureen and Diane's comment, I'm wondering if it's appropriate uh, for GMP, for Sarah, to share with us um, the concept of the resiliency zone. I think if Sarah, do you just want to give a very quick synopsis of that? That's a good piece of context that it would be helpful for people to hear about. So yeah, sure. Sarah, do you want to, do you feel like you could do that quickly? Poor Sarah has not great connection, so she's keeping her video off. Yeah, I hope you guys can hear me. But um, briefly, um, we've you know met with the town of Rochester, and we are interested in exploring a resiliency zone, which is basically just a system designed to keep the lights on, keep things running during um, severe weather events, really significant outages. Um, a great example of this is our project in Panton, um, which combined solar with some storage, as well as a couple of microgrid controls, um, which is going to be put online pretty soon. Um, I'll keep it that short and just drop a few links in the chat for anyone who's interested in learning more. That's great. Thanks, Sarah. Could be a really excellent opportunity for Rochester for sure. So thank you. Other ideas for uh, the Rochester region. James, go for it. Um, this is kind of backing up, but it came to my mind in terms of our assets. One of our greatest assets through this whole area is our high-speed internet. You know, we have fiber to the home, and that's pretty rare. We've had it for, what, two or three years now in the Valley. So that's we don't need to travel so much if you're still working or participating. Yeah, that's important. I'm really glad you mentioned that. And increasingly, there is a sensitivity to the importance of broadband connectivity and energy opportunities because the grid is now much more of a dynamic thing and for people to really participate in certain programs you really need good internet connectivity so that's there are multiple layers to that as an asset you're you're spot on thank you for mentioning that who else has some ideas yep chris uh, this may not be very popular because of its cost but um Irene uh, showed us that the substation location in the floodplain in Rochester is not a, a great spot. And so something long-term to think about, especially for Green Mountain Power, would be uh, relocating the substation to higher ground. Not popular, but something to think about. Got it. Thanks, Chris. And you guys, don't worry about popularity or expense. This is a brainstorming session. You have no limitations uh, at the moment. It'll be, you all will come back together to make some priority decisions about, about your work. So don't, don't self-limit at this point. Uh, Diane, go for it. I'm not sure if this fits into this particular discussion, but um, it's always been on my mind for waste management. Um, because if you make waste, you have to do something with it, be it compost, be it plastic, be it cardboard. And looking at specifically the TerraCycle options, some of the TerraCycle options are product specific, which means the manufacturer will pay for you to send it back to them free of charge to recycle, um, such as BIC pens, for instance. If you collect a whole bunch of big pens, you get a label, you get the packaging materials, you send it back, it gets recycled. Things that are difficult to even recycle nowadays are um, Colgate uh, toothpaste tubes. What do you do with a toothpaste tube, really? But Colgate through TerraCycle has an option which is free, 
where you set up a recycling station for Colgate related items. They send you the packaging for free, you ship it back to them, they take care of the waste. Um, some of the TerraCycle are definitely, um, you have to buy the box and ship it back depending on what the items are. And I would recommend any, anyone that's interest, interested in waste management to look at the TerraCycle options that are on their website. But somehow, if we're looking also into waste management to also involve the town in that, can we set up the boxes somewhere um, where people can access them 24 seven? And can we also, I mean, Christine mentioned that cost whenever we discuss something it can be an issue and will be an issue on doing these things. Can we cost, um, what is that called, tax shifting, for instance, can we carve out a piece of the taxes that we pay into the town and label that section environmental tax for um, environmental projects that we want to do as a town? Because I don't know that much about tax shifting, but that is a term that other cities, towns, and countries are using to um, pay for some of these things and just making it specifically for environmental projects that that town, city, state, or country want to do. Got it. Thanks, Diane. A couple of ideas there, and I'll just sort of restate them back to be sure I got them. Just thinking about waste and some creative ways to, to, to recycle uh, or repurpose some of the more hard to recycle items. And then thinking about some way, whether it's related to taxes or in a different way to sort of raise funds for environmental projects in town. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an example in my little town of Montpelier, they've, they've built a revolving loan fund specifically for energy conservation efforts in the municipality. So there are mm -hmm. some other municipal examples of that. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Other ideas do um so um this is i guess an idea but is it's more like a, a factor of what would help in coming into play is is the um coordination and cooperation between the town structures and um private individuals so we've had um over the years several um <clears throat> movements towards trying to install solar on town property and we keep coming up against walls about either the structure is not substantial enough or we don't have an appropriate um, piece of land to, to put them on. Um, I'm thinking of the um, Green Mountain Power um, Resiliency Zone project. It seems that that's, if we can open up the options of um, some uh, private owned land to how something like that, it would really um, might expand the, the likelihood of, of something coming to fruition. Great, thanks, June. Sue, I see you're unmuted. Is that a, yeah, yeah. go for it. Um, yeah, John, you mentioned at the outset that uh, if you don't, you know, think your topic fits in with what exactly is written in the, you know, okay, so I'm a musician. <laughs> Have at it, go for it. And an artist, okay. So the first thing I think of is uh, um, we can certainly further the cause through art and music. I mean, that would be the, my first thought. I'm sure there's other ways, um, but we have a, a very newly formed alliance um, in Rochester, but we're, we're inviting um, others in the Valley to join us um, to find ways that we can um, uh, cooperate and, and um, uh, just add to the add to the value of uh, of our towns through mm -hmm. art and music. Yeah, wonderful, super. Thanks, Sue. <laughs> it's all interconnected, and I say again and again, nothing isn't a part of the climate conversation at this point. There's not no no out of bounds. So, other ideas, Christine, go for it. Just to jump off of. Sue and sort of thinking about the people and getting the people motivated um, and also jumping off of Carolyn, um, could we not sort of laud and uplift the folks that already have um, moved in the direction of solar in our valleys uh, in the in the different towns and maybe write an article for the Herald about them or honor them in some way at our um, 
at our town gatherings like the Harvest Fair or et cetera, et cetera. Some way to um, to sort of shine light on those that are moving in this direction and to, to um, sort of move everybody in that direction <laughs> through positive reinforcement. Great, I love it. All right, uh, Mary Beth. I was just wanting to build on that idea and say maybe we could have a weekend where people who had either solar homes or electric cars or some sort of alternative um, structure or vehicle in their possession had an open house and anybody could come and see them and ask questions and hear about it. Great. Diane. I'm not sure about the logistics of this, or this would, or if it would even be appropriate for town meeting day. But if we're trying to get the the community involved and to increase the participation of our communities, perhaps I know that for town meeting day there's tables set out before we go into the auditorium, and some of them are questionnaires. But have a environmental questionnaire. Uh, dear Rochester community member, uh, what would you like to see done in town regarding climate change? And let's get the feeling of the whole community, what they would like to see, and perhaps get more buy-in if we get um, uh, 500 responses on, yeah, we would like to see a better and more resilient electric grid in town to for uh, for EV vehicles in the future, or we would like to have learn more about solar to just get the temperature of everybody. And I thought the only way we could really do that other than a mass mailing is maybe for town meeting day. But again, I don't know the logistics of that. Got it. I think, yeah, got the idea. Don't, don't worry about logistics. The idea is sort of pull the community as a whole, really to gauge people's interest in various opportunities and then to build buy-in too, which I think mm -hmm. is an important point. I see Jeff Gephardt has a hand up and then I see James does. So Jeff first. Uh, I was just gonna mention that the Vermont Energy Atlas is a website uh, that you can go on and you can actually see the locations in Rochester, Granville, Hancock, wherever in the state, there is a grid connected solar installation or wind for that matter. Um, so that is something that, uh, can be seen and it's actually a fairly high percentage in Rochester. Super, thanks Jeff. Uh, Jim. Uh, speaking of, of trying to uh, to find out where, you know, what people think and whatever, well, have you had any success with the poll that uh, is out there now? You know, part of signing up for this, it also directs you, you know, give us your thoughts. We've had a couple of responses, but honestly, I haven't promoted it too much because I really wanted to promote tonight and now I'm gonna shift to promoting the survey. So yeah, uh, and any help you all can give to, to spread the word on that would be great. Well, someone should check it out because you know I, I filled it out about an hour ago. And then when I finished and press send, he says, well, thank you for participating in the, the thoughts about the uh, London area. Oh no, we didn't correct that. Thank you. All right, that's good feedback. I'll make sure that gets fixed. You know, we re reper hey, we recycle at VCRD. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> guilt guilty as charged. <laughs> right. Uh, that's good feedback. Thank you. Who else? Any other? You know, we're about to uh, hand it off to our visiting team to provide a few closing re re reflections. But I want to. So the, in other words, the trains leave in the station. Uh, who else has a few ideas before we do that? It, or does anybody? Carolyn. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, Carolyn. You know, music is a real motivator in this valley. And um, Sue saying that she's a musician, yeah. And I know, because I lived through the first, second world war and the other sense, and I know some of those rooting songs that they used to find people singing them all the time, just to feel better about some things. And um, why not compose a song 
a two. And get so we get the kids singing it and everything, you know, and that's what will influence their parents and other people is make it something that this lifts our spirit, not just a heavy chore to have to handle that, oh, so-and-so will do it. They're, they're, they're always helping a lot, but I just can't, you know. That's why I thought of doing little things that everybody can do that are no effort, but see reward. But how about cheering it on with some songs, Sue and Christine, you know? <laughs> so when the kids walking down the street, they're singing and dancing the song about <laughs> saving energy. <laughs> I, like it. We read, I have this friend who wrote one, actually, so maybe I'll share it with everybody later. <laughs> Sounds great. Thanks, Carolyn. All right. You know, we, I, my job is to mind the clock, and we've got about seven minutes left before we go back to the main room. And I want to give our visiting team a chance to, to share a few sort of quick reflections as we bring things to a close. Uh, and remember, like... If you've got other ideas, that survey that we just mentioned is a great way to get them in. Frankly, you could just like be in touch with us. Like there's no, um, you know, we will be welcoming ideas for the next few weeks. It's not like there's a hard stop there. So uh, with that, I am going to, let me just give you all the order for the visiting team so that you know what to expect. I'm gonna go to uh, Becca White first and then We'll hear from Peter Gregory, and then uh, Alex, and then Sarah. So Becca, you want to share a few thoughts as we wrap things up here? Sure. Thanks so much. And again, I'm from Efficiency Vermont, and I actually live in White River Junction. So if you look at my map, I'm not too far from you. Uh, and I, my two reflections I would take away from this conversation is, first off, that you have a lot of experts in the room. This is a very, there's some, there's some real deep knowledge here on energy. And I was very surprised. Um, and John, you commented on too, just the substation conversation. That's um, what a great group of folks who, who um, you've definitely done taken some time already to consider energy in your community. So I think you've got some fertile soil um, to be able to move on a lot of different projects. Uh, and then the second reflection I had um, was there's a lot of creativity when it comes to, it sounded like, an, and we kind of ended on it too um, uh, with Carolyn's point, but uh, trying to bring community into this conversation, whether it's through music and art, Sue, you mentioned it. Um, that's a really interesting angle. And I, I have the pleasure right now of being a part of the Button Up Vermont campaign, <laughs> which is our uh, weatherization campaign um, that does grassroots outreach. And that's one thing we really try to work on. So I think that this group also has um, a real opportunity to do either like an education or something campaign um, based on the feedback I'm hearing. And I'm here from Efficiency Vermont to help you um, on any of those topics to give guidance and expertise. So I don't know, is that what you're hoping for, John? That's great, <laughs> okay. yeah. Thank you. And, and, you know, I should have said in my opening remarks, Efficiency Vermont, along with Green Mountain Power, really core partners in this work that we do and have a real orientation towards community. And it's, I just have to say, it's, it's hugely appreciated your willingness to come participate in these conversations. Yeah, it's fun. You guys are a good group. I got to go to, was it Sandy's bookstore? Is that what's right in downtown? Oh, man. oh yeah. I got to tell you the bagels, the holla, I've been bringing home holla. It's like, it's everything fabulous. All right, Peter, you. <laughs> um, well, like Becca said, this is a great group, wonderful ideas. Um, uh, it makes me excited to uh, hear all the good things. I think a couple of takeaways for me is the some of the assets you guys mentioned that you have, um, you know, they're very, they're, they're expensive and wonderful assets to have. A lot of the communities don't have like good internet and, um, you know, good defined center, um, you know, three-phase power. I mean, you know, those things that not everybody has are very difficult to obtain in, in, in the near term. And some of the challenges you mentioned, on the other hand, are ones that I think a lot of communities have, you know, the, uh, the age of buildings, the retrofits and those kinds of things, uh, uh, the transportation issues. And those are issues that um, I think you'll be able to get some help on from state government and, and state programs and federal programs. So, 
you're not out of luck there. So I think the challenges are, you're not alone in that. Not that they're easy to solve, but you're not alone. And then the ideas, I, I really love the uh, lead by example. I think this town has is, is got the right mindset to, to invest in itself. And that's the best education one can have. And, you know, the talking about writing articles and, and celebrating the work that has been done and, and the investments that private citizens have made is just, it builds on itself. So a lot, a lot of good things. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. Now on to Sarah at Green Mountain Power. First of all, thank you all so much for having me. I'm super impressed and GMP is really excited to be working with you for resiliency zones work, but also just in general. Um, I love hearing someone say that GMP is an asset. That's what we like to hear. And I really encourage you all to, to please try to think of us um, as an asset whenever possible. You know, I definitely am available to answer any questions and our business team is also a great resource for any commercial customers. Great. Thanks, Sarah. And I think I went out of order, but Alex, to close it off from Preservation Trust of Vermont. Thanks. No, thank you. Uh, what, you know, I'm never let down by how invested Vermonters are in helping their communities. And Rochester is definitely one of those towns. Um, it seems like your main asset, your main challenge, and the main area for opportunity is your surroundings, right? Your cultural and natural environment. You want to work together to build your common infrastructure, preserve that environment, and your self-sufficiency. I, I think self-sufficiency is kind of one of those things I kept hearing about. You know, the, the environment feeding the, you know, the woods and the surroundings and the, you know, energy around you and the downtown. Using that environment, those cultural and natural resources for the common good, I think was another kind of really key, key message here. And as June said, you know, looking back into the past for how we have created energy and used it for the common good, um, that's how Vermonters and have been working for generations. So um, again, just thank you all for, for being part of this. And thank you for inviting PTV. Well, uh, thank you, Alex. Thank you to the visiting team. And most important, thank you to you all. I think we're going to head back into the main room. You can see that message there. We'll uh, all go back into the main room and then we'll shake things up and go back into some breakouts for the second hour here. Really appreciate everyone's participation. Thanks. Recording stopped. Carolyn, do you see, um, oh, yep, yep. Just making sure everyone knows how to get out of here and then get back, if, yeah. Hey everybody, welcome back. And I just got a message from the other room that they're gonna run a couple of minutes late. Well, we got automatically oh. sent back. I feel we, <laughs> we cut off some visiting team members and I'm so sorry about that. I well, didn't yeah. realize we were automatically coming back. Oh, sorry. Well, we, we could do an audible if, I don't know if it's too awkward, but we would be happy to listen to a couple of further reflections before we go on. I think we have a minute or two. So Jenna, I'll follow your lead if that feels okay. I told Josh and Dan that they are going to go first in the next one. All right. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, uh, I'm just going to bring things to a close and do it really quickly because I know we, we all have things to get on to here. Uh, first of all, huge appreciation to everybody. I suspect you have other things that you might prefer to do on a Thursday evening, a nice Thursday evening than be on a screen. Uh, but what you're doing is you're showing a commitment to the place you live in. And that's uh, what our privilege is at the Council on Rural Development is to be part of conversations where people come together and think about their future and think beyond their own home and family and think about their community and what they can contribute uh, to their community. And I will say this, in the conversations I've had as we've started this process, the thing I'm just struck with, it's, it's true across the state of Vermont, it's really true in your valley, 
you all have a deep shared commitment to the place that you live in. You feel passionate about it. And not only are you passionate about the place you live, that is a really beautiful place. You also are willing to roll up your sleeves and do work uh, for that place. And that is a powerful thing to be a witness to at the Council on Rural Development. Our next step in this process, as I've said, is gonna be November 1st. Our plan and intention is to do that in person where we'll gather, we'll grapple with the ideas that you've come up with, and you will decide on some priorities for this work moving forward. And any help that you all can provide as we look ahead to that November 1st, how do we broaden that conversation? Who's not in this room? Who should be a part of this conversation? We will be a partner in spreading the word and doing that. And so stay tuned as we give you sort of the tools to spread the word to all of the Quintown region about these next steps. Uh, Tremendous appreciation to the partners, our visiting team who took a couple hours out of their busy lives to be part of this conversation tonight. And in particular to all of you for, for being engaged and, and involved. Really appreciate it. And with that, let's say good night and we will see you. Uh, uh, and I do see some questions about logistics. We'll be in touch about that as we figure out the parameters of that event on, on November 1st. So thank you so much, everybody.